W5. Living strictly by the good book. God's law is above and beyond any human law. Where faith is challenged and innocence shattered. I felt like ending my life. By a religion's darkest doctrines. It's an organization that's supposed to love and protect children. And no one will act. Why won't you call the police on pedophiles? Avery Haynes. Court documents obtained by W5. Investigates claims of abuse and denial. Who do you turn to? Who do you have as support? When victims plead for justice. And he said he didn't do anything, so there's nothing that we can do. Scripture shields the accused. There has to be a confession or two witnesses. Survivors are shunned by families and the congregation. They are brainwashing everybody. When blind faith turns a blind eye. And he told me that I'm a liar. Here is Kevin Newman. Hello, and thanks for joining us. This week, a full edition W5 investigation into an alleged worldwide cover-up of sex abuse involving an organization you may least expect, the Jehovah's Witnesses. The sect is involved in lawsuits in Canada and around the world alleging its doctrine victimizes abused children. W5's Avery Haynes travels to London, New York, California, and across Canada to hear from victims who say that religious rules and intimidation ensure trauma is rarely, if ever, reported to police. When you think of Jehovah's Witnesses, you probably think of something like this. Hi, how are you? How are you? Hi, I'm well. How are you? I'm good, how are you? Good. My name's Parker, this is Spike. Polite disciples going door to door, gently spreading Jehovah's word. But the doorstep conversations on this day are anything but routine. We're just informing people about a dangerous group that's in your backyard. A dangerous what? A dangerous, a dangerous group. group. What dangerous group? Uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses. That's right. They're warning people about the Christian sect they once called their own. They hide pedophiles. They say the Jehovah's Witnesses organization is a secretive, destructive, and controlling group. A group whose policies have ignored child sex abuse while protecting known pedophiles from police. Before, witnesses would be afraid to speak up and talk because they would be disfellowshipped and they right. lose their family. They call themselves the vast apostate army. An apostate is someone who has abandoned their faith. Within the Jehovah's Witnesses ranks, it's high up on the list of sins. These former Jehovah's Witnesses have come to this quaint town of Warwick, New York, because just down the road, is the world headquarters of the Jehovah's Witnesses. They call it Bethel, the house of God, sprawling over 250 acres. 800 people live and work here, including the group's legal advisors, support staff, and the governing body. Eight men who establish and supervise Jehovah's Witnesses doctrine. They just opened a new headquarters right in your town, and they protect pedophiles, we want you guys to know. They actually have some policies in place that allow these predators to be going door to door. Tricia Franginia traveled here from Edmonton, a long, expensive trip that was worth it to protest a religious group that she says stole her childhood. As a child, every night that you went to bed, you believed this may be your last night, you may not wake up. Of course, it was always constantly that Armageddon could be coming at any minute. What does Armageddon look like in the world of the Jehovah's Witnesses? In my head, it was giant fireballs coming out of the sky and people screaming and dying in front of me. A fiery death wasn't the only thing that scared Trisha. In fact, in a way, her own world had already ended. Since she was a child, she says, she had been abused by someone she should have been able to trust the most. Can you talk to me about the kind of abuse that you suffered? sexual abuse uh, from my father. The abuse um, started as soon as I was born until I was approximately 14 years old. And which one is you? This one. Trisha says her mother suspected something was going on and went to the church elders for advice. They 
basically told her that she wasn't fulfilling her wifely duties and that she had to be a more submissive wife and make her husband happier. She's told you need to be servicing your husband more? Yeah. And where does that sit in your heart and how does it sit? It's heavy. Um, I've gone through bouts of uh, severe depression where I felt like ending my life because I was so unheard when I was basically screaming for help as a child. Eventually, Trisha found the courage to go to an elder herself when she was 12. Help is not what she found. And I explained to him what was going on and he said, I don't have any proof and I don't have any witnesses, so I need to respect my family and not to bring it up again. You told an elder that your dad was sexually abusing you and he said, show us the proof? Mm-hmm. They put the onus on the victim to produce two credible eyewitnesses um, to their assault. And by credible eyewitnesses, they mean other Jehovah's Witnesses that saw it with their own eyes. It's actually called the two witness rule, inspired by passages from both testaments of the Bible. So it's not as though the Jehovah's Witnesses have just made up their rules. I mean, they've taken stuff from within their translation of the Bible to validate their policies. Yeah, absolutely. We Andre Gagné is a theology studies professor at Montreal's Concordia University. You find a passage here in Deuteronomy chapter 19. No single witness may convict another for any error or any sin that he may commit. On the testimony of two witnesses or on the testimony of three witnesses, the matter should be established. No single witness may convict. Biblical words Jehovah's Witnesses take literally. But if there's not two witnesses, it's up to Jehovah. Absolutely. They have what is called a theocratic worldview, meaning that God's law is above and beyond any human law. If I have to submit to any kind of law, I'm going to submit to God's law. These videos, produced for the Jehovah's Witnesses website, show happy and carefree worshipers. What they don't show? The sheltered lives, the strict rules meant to protect against the Satan-led outside world. Witnesses are required to spend hours spreading Jehovah's word door to door and at street corner carts like these. They don't celebrate holidays, no Christmases, no birthdays. And those who don't obey the rules risk being shunned by friends and family. You have very, very little connection with the outside world. Your entire world is that. So if you're shunned from that, uh, who do you turn to? Who do you have as support? It's very difficult. And Jehovah's Witnesses believe in Armageddon, the final battle between God and all wicked humans. They believe it'll happen any day now. The Armageddon is a battle. It's a battle against the forces of darkness, and the, the only way to be saved is to actually follow Jehovah and adopt our, our interpretation of the Bible. That's, that's essentially it. Perhaps the most controversial of their beliefs has been their policy on what to do with child sexual abuse allegations. Court documents obtained by W5 show that Jehovah's Witnesses elders are instructed to keep a record of every single child sexual abuse allegation and then forward those allegations onto the organization's own legal department. Now, in many countries, including here in Canada, the law requires that allegations like that be dealt with by police. And yet there's ample evidence that calling the police has not been the regular practice of the Jehovah's Witnesses. Back in New York, Excuse me, folks, can I have a moment of your time? One of the protesters does inspire Jehovah's Witnesses to call police. His name is Zeb Leatherman, and when he's not peacefully handing out flyers... Howdy, folks. He's doing this. Just another day in the office. Zeb strolls in and interrupts Jehovah's Witnesses services. We have a special announcement. It's concerning the two witness rule. Telling the congregation their religious sect has some dark secrets. We're gonna ask you to leave, sir. Leaving, sir. And this hasn't happened just once. For the past month, Zeb has driven some 4,000 kilometers across the United States, stopping uninvited at 60 Jehovah's Witnesses churches, which are called Kingdom Halls. Our Heavenly Father 
We don't have to listen to these men anymore. Let's go. And all that happens is we wind up sweeping these cases under the wrong. Okay, let's go. That's actually trespassing. No, it's not. You're invited. It's a public meeting. What's going through your mind when you open those doors to the Kingdom Hall and know what you're about to do? Pretty scared, but is there another way? I, I don't know another way right now, so I stick with this one. Get off the premises, I'm calling the police. Really? Yes. So far. They usually call the police, and then they usually grab me, manhandle me, and throw me out. Hold on, hey. Why won't you call the police on pedophiles? Hey. It's the only way I personally know that I can really make a difference. I don't like doing it. it it doesn't feel right. And some places it might be illegal, but I don't know another way to teach that many people at one point in time. You come in here to disrupt uh -huh. us? I am. I'm right, trying to no, tear I'm fine. trying to tear down the tower. Zeb was born into a Jehovah's Witness family, but left in his 20s when he started doubting their strict interpretation of the Bible, including that two witness rule. Now, his entire family shuns him. What's your point? Why are you doing this? Because my ultimate goal is to free my family from this, this cult. Today, Zeb won't be alone. When he slips into this kingdom hall, just outside the religious group's world headquarters, a dozen of his fellow protesters will join him. They've sneaked in and spread out among the congregation. And as soon as the opening hymn ends, they start the interruptions, camera phones rolling. If I could just have your attention for a moment, guys. I want you to ask your elders about the two witness rule because the authorities are not called okay. when children are abused. The Watchtower Bible and Tract Society in of New France, York is being investigated. I'm product. talking here, sir, I'm sorry. We're asking you very because nicely at this time to leave. So please Google all you can, folks. Learn all you can so that you can maybe escape this cult. Abandoning their hope. I have no more time in my life for you guys. I'm done with this whole thing, man. When all faith is lost. It really does destroy your soul. When W5 continues. The Watchtower Bible and Tract Society in of New France, York is being investigated. I'm talking here, sir, I'm sorry. A dozen former Jehovah's Witnesses have infiltrated this Kingdom Hall. It's a few miles from the religious sect's world headquarters in New York State. Among them, Canadian Tricia Franginia from Edmonton. My father sexually abused me for the first 14 years of my life. They say Jehovah's Witnesses' policies fail to protect child sex abuse victims, shield pedophiles, and shun people who speak out. And they want this congregation to hear what they have to say. I was raped and was told you shouldn't have done that, and I was disfellowshipped for it. 18 years old and not allowed to have my mother talk to me for a year. One after another, the protesters stand up to make disturbing allegations, allegations that many of these congregants have likely never heard before. My ex-husband is a pedophile. Right he raised right two children in the We're King Hall. He is still allowed to be talked to by everybody. This is an organization that's supposed to love and protect children. Your invitation to be here has been revoked. Don't shun your children, jwfacts.com. After several minutes, everyone is finally ejected, and the chaos spills outside. But the accusations continue. Can I ask you, how many pedophiles have you encountered in your, in your record as an elder? I'm sorry, there's no comment. Yeah, you, know, you, you treat <laughs> us like we're dead. I will not hate you guys. I will not hate you. You look at me like, oh, I don't exist. I'm telling you, as a man, I'm, I'm right here. So I have no more time in my life for you guys. I'm done with this whole thing, man. Done. A single police officer shows up, and the group slowly leaves. They reassemble in a parking lot across the street, happy they forced a different point of view into fresh ears. Tricia Franginia, who says she survived years of sexual abuse as a child, thinks the protesters' plan wasn't perfect, but it's still worth celebrating. You could tell that people were just like, oh God, like plugging their ears. But there were a couple in the front that seemed really affected by it. So you never know who's going to go home and, and 
try and find the truth. The police officer returns a few minutes later, and the group thinks that they're going to be told to leave. Obviously, it's private property, so you, you, know, you have to leave, and you guys... But instead of asking them to clear out, he has something else on his mind. Holy Spirit, what's your view on that? It's an active force, just like we're breathing here. For the next 20 minutes, the group and the cop talk religion. I know the, uh, the Christian church and the Jehovah's Witness obviously have some theological differences. The reception much friendlier than what they got at the Kingdom Hall. All right, well, uh, good luck up Thank there, you. and good luck to the war with police officers up there. <laughs> <laughs> Again, right? Thank you so much. Have a really good rest of the day. Have a great day. The group may be small and their tactics improvised, but what they're saying echoes a much larger movement that's being heard in courts and high levels of government around the world. In 2015, an Australian royal commission investigated how the Jehovah's Witnesses organization handles allegations of child sexual abuse and how often those allegations are reported to police. It's not done unless there's a legal requirement for it to be done, is there? I just check. After weeks of testimony from victims, elders, and experts, the commission concluded, we do not believe that children are adequately protected from the risk of sexual abuse. They went on to state, we do not consider the Jehovah's Witness organization to be an organization which responds adequately to child sexual abuse. In this exchange, senior counsel of the commission, Angus Stewart, refuses to let a Jehovah's Witness elder deflect blame. What ability have we got to protect every child in Australia? What you can do is you can report to uh, the child protection authorities. And that is done in some cases. But generally it's not done, is it? No. The commission also uncovered what had, up until that moment, been just a rumor that the Jehovah's Witnesses kept a secret database of every single known and suspected child abuser within their congregations. Not one was reported by the church to secular authorities. Since 1950, JW elders in Australia have documented potential child sexual abuse cases against 1,006 members. Not one of them ever reported to police. Half a world away, Jehovah's Witnesses are also coming under legal scrutiny in the United Kingdom. How difficult is it to litigate uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses? They're extremely difficult to litigate against. Kathleen Hallisey is a London-based lawyer who won the first ever judgment against the Jehovah's Witnesses in the UK for historic sexual abuse. Her office has become the go-to law firm for challenging the Jehovah's Witnesses. Do you believe that the Jehovah's Witnesses have a policy that purposefully protects pedophiles and, and puts children at risk? I do. I would describe it as a scandal and a global cover-up and a protection of abusers. At the risk of children? Absolutely. Hallisey says a British public inquiry is looking into how institutions have failed to protect children from sexual abuse, and there's now public pressure to open a separate investigation that focuses solely on Jehovah's Witnesses. If you have a policy that requires there to be a second witness to child abuse, it means that virtually every allegation of child abuse is going to go no further. And that puts the child at risk, it puts other children at risk, and it protects the person who's the abuser. And now Canada has joined the fray. Two class action lawsuits have been filed against the Jehovah's Witnesses, officially known as the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. The courts haven't yet certified either lawsuit, which accused the organization of failing to protect children from sexual abuse. It is a captive organization, so that means you can never leave. Christian Gutierrez was one of those children. He's the public face of one of the lawsuits, a suit that seeks $66 million and will represent dozens of alleged victims. I like this one. Christian and his yeah. wife, Katya, live here in Calgary. Christmas ended months ago, but their apartment is still peppered with decorations and even a tree. We are obsessed with Christmas because we've only celebrated Christmas four times. We weren't allowed as Jehovah's Witnesses, so it's really special, and we try to keep it up as long as possible. 
four years ago, both were disfellowshipped, cut out and shunned, because they started questioning the authority of the leaders. But it took years of fear and abuse to get there, starting when Christian was just a child. I remember I used to be a, a child that liked to dance a lot. And as I was um, getting older, um, that started to stop. I remember coming to sit on the couch with my father and he would have the book on one side and he would have the belt on the other side ready if I didn't summarize what I had read properly, I would get a spanking. And Eating. Yeah. The strict corporal punishment was nothing compared to what happened to Christian when he was just five. I was um, hurt as a child um, by this man. It was very upsetting because uh, to this day, certain smells can make me remember it. Um, if I hear someone buckling their belt, you know, it brings me back to the memories of it. The past is still too painful to relive in detail, but Christian says he was sexually abused by a man in his congregation. When my father found out, I got in very big trouble. And that is one of the most crushing moments because what you need is you need help and you need support. And what I got from him was, why did you go to the elders? Does anyone say to you, oh, Christian, we need to go to the police. Who, who is this? Are you OK? It was never brought up to go to the police, not once. Instead of calling the police, Christian says elders told him he could heal himself by reading. They gave me magazines of their own literature on sexual abuse and that these magazines were going to help me to get better. They were going to make me feel better um, from what I went through. Whatever happened to the, to the man who sexually abused you? To my knowledge, nothing has happened. Is he still in the, in the organization? I believe so. Katya knows her husband's pain. She knows what it's like to grow up as a Jehovah's Witness with a dark secret. Parts of your childhood are in here. Is mm -hmm. it weird to look through these photographs? It is because like, it's my childhood and you want to look at them and be happy, but it just reminds you, like it reminds me of all the bad times. Even back then, Katya couldn't hide her misery, not even from the camera. In my eyes, you can just see. Sadness. Just, yeah, it's just sadness. Sunglasses could shield red puffy eyes, but they couldn't hide the haunted face of a victim. And it's kind of PTSD looking at a picture of me at that age in a bathtub, because that's the time I had certain abuse happen to me was in a bathtub. Do you want to share with us what happened to you, Katya? Yeah. I was sexually abused by a close family relative of mine. And this person was also an elder and also a Jehovah's Witness. I don't feel like going into exact detail of what took place, but um, I was you know, sexually touched. I was just very stressed and scared, and I had a lot of anxiety. So much anxiety that at the age of just 10, Katya took a kitchen knife into her room and held it to her wrist. I feel like I was going through all this and nobody noticed. And I, I, I just, I was looking for someone to, to help me. And I thought maybe in a child's mind, maybe if I tried to take my life, it would get someone to, to notice that I, I need help. Before Katya could hurt herself, her mother found her with that knife and rushed her to the hospital. So you get to the hospital, and what did the doctors at the hospital say to you? Um, they did a lot of questioning just on my history, what my family life was like. They asked me, is there anything else that you want to share, anything else that's causing you to feel scared at home or anything or in your life? And that's when I, I said, yeah, there is something else that I want to say, and I told them that I was being sexually abused at the same time. You told the doctors? Yeah. And it was one of those doctors who called the police. Shortly after, a close family member of Katya's was charged with sexual assault and sexual interference. But things did not get easier. After speaking to police, Katya was summoned to talk to the elders, a 10-year-old girl in a room full of men. What did they specifically ask you about the sexual abuse? I remember the elders actually asked me, 
do you know if there's two other witnesses involved to this? And I said, no. And they said, well, nothing we can do. Leave it in Jehovah's hands. They didn't even say we're sorry to hear what happened to you or anything. Katya says one elder took it even farther. And he said, if you really were sexually abused, that you would have squealed like a pig, which you did not, which means it never happened. And he told me that I'm a liar and that I need to clear this person's name and tell the police what I said was not true. Katya refused, but it didn't matter. Before the trial, her alleged abuser fled to Europe, where he lives to this day and is the father of two young girls. You both feel in your experience that this organization protected the pedophile at the detriment of the child of you both. Oh yeah, for sure. It really does destroy your soul. It's, it's almost like, in my opinion, it is murder because you kill the person inside. Hiding the crimes. The written policy was we keep known child molesters secret. While victims suffer. My innocence was taken away. When W5 continues. Welcome back to W5. Avery Haynes' investigation into the Jehovah's Witnesses doctrine has unveiled sexual abuse survivors who claimed they reported their abuse to elders, but police were never called in. Well, now some of those victims are taking the religious sect to court, which will be a difficult and costly battle. All around the world, People come together every week at places of worship called Kingdom Halls. The Jehovah's Witnesses official website hosts dozens of videos that depict warm family scenes. It's a stark contrast to the emotional court battles and international investigations that allege the organization has covered up child sex assault cases. Now, two class action lawsuits have been filed in Canada, one for $66 million. Neither has yet been certified to proceed. There's one place with a long history of taking on Jehovah's Witnesses, and it's right here in California. Dozens of civil suits have been filed against the organization in this state. Each of them settled quietly out of court, except for one, the historic case of Candace Conti. Now, Candace was just nine years old when she went out door to door, spreading the word of Jehovah. Because she was so young, she was sent out with an older man, a man who had something else on his mind, and it had nothing to do with God. Do you feel stronger after all of this? I, I do. There's a lot of times where I don't, but um, I do. Candace grew up as a Jehovah's Witness and from an early age embraced everything it seemed to offer. She wanted to get to heaven for a very specific reason. My grandfather died at a really, really, well, for me, a really young age. And um, the thought that I could see him again was one of my driving forces to be the best Jehovah's Witness that I could be. And to do that, you know, you, you spend your time, you spend your energy, you go out and you talk to people and you, and you try to bring them into the, to the fold. Candace's door-to-door -door minder was this man. Jonathan Kendrick was 41 years old in 1995. Instead of taking Candace to preach Jehovah's Word, He took her to his own house, repeatedly, for more than a year. How old were you? I was nine. Can you give me a sense of what happened when you were a nine-year-old girl? I was taken advantage of. My innocence was taken away. Her innocence may have been taken away, but her fight most definitely was not. Candace kept the abuse secret for years, but when she was 16, she searched Kendrick's name online and found this, a public child abuse database. He was a convicted child molester. She knew she had to speak up. The sense of guilt that I had felt, I think, had pushed me to trying to prevent this from happening to other children. Candace reported her allegations to an elder. It didn't go well. You walked in and said to the elders, I'm also a victim. I am also a survivor of this man. 
And what did they say to you? I was literally told, quote unquote, what do you want me to do, start a holy crusade? Months passed and Candace was finally summoned by the elders. They told her they had interviewed Jonathan Kendrick. And he said he didn't do anything, so there's nothing that we can do. You know, and so that's where that terrible, hideous two witness rule comes into play. The two witness rule, a Bible inspired doctrine that dictates elders cannot discipline someone unless there are two witnesses to the alleged sin. You can't even really wrap your head around that, you know, a two, a two witness rule. I mean, you, let her, you, you don't have one witness to a child molestation, you know. So but Candace I, I didn't back down. Instead, she got a lawyer. I describe Candace Conti as the client that I hope every good lawyer gets once in a career. Rick Simmons was Candace's lawyer. These are exhibits, and they represent uh, a couple of smoking guns in the Candace Conti case. They do. One is a letter sent by the elders at North Fremont Congregation, where Candace had been a member all of her life, two years before the sexual abuse of Candace by Jonathan Kendrick began. The letter says Kendrick admitted to elders that he sexually assaulted a girl before they paired him with Candace. In this deposition video, you can hear Rick Simmons ask an elder about that admission. Do you recall becoming aware of a report of sexual abuse of a child by Jonathan Kendrick? Um, yes. He had called us to his home to discuss a, um, um, or to confess to uh, an incident with his uh, stepdaughter. So they knew that they had a sexual predator in their congregation who was going out with children. They knew that. And what about this one? This is a body of elder letter, and it instructs the elders in every congregation in the United States that if they receive a report of child molestation within their congregation, that they are to keep it secret. The letter states, there is a time to keep quiet Problems are created when elders unwisely reveal matters that should be kept confidential. It was an order, and the elders obeyed. We don't make that public to the congregation. That's confidential. The written policy of the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses was, we keep known child molesters secret. The jury awarded Candace $28 million, the richest judgment against a religious group for one person in U.S. history. Since then, it's been whittled down to just under $3 million. And that's because an appeals court decided that the organization did not have a responsibility to warn the congregation about Kendrick. All of that money aside, she didn't get what she was after, which was a change in the policy. I don't think she got a formal change in the policy, but the publicity, the knowledge that when your doorbell rings on a Saturday morning, the person standing there could be a convicted child molester posing as a religious believer. Uh, that message has gotten out. Beyond just delivering a powerful message, Simmons thinks lawsuits like Canada's new multi-million dollar suits will eventually force the Jehovah's Witnesses to change. They have tremendous wealth, billions of dollars in wealth, but the price of abuse is getting higher, and at some point it gets too high to be able to withstand it. You believe that? Yes, it will because the financial cost, like it did the Catholic Church, will make sure that they have to change to survive. Do you believe you'll ever see a day where the Jehovah's Witnesses strike that two-witness rule from their doctrine? Yes, I, I hope. I think that, that the two-witness rule works for, you know, stealing a loaf of bread, but it does not work for uh, rape and, and child abuse at all. Speaking out publicly has cost Candace just about every family member every friend she ever knew as a Jehovah's Witness. To this day, she is still being shunned by her own father. Extreme shunning is a destructive and controlling aspect of the Christian sect, and some say the fear of shunning is why believers don't challenge the rules, even if it kills them. A tragic example of that deadly fear unfolded near Quebec City, 
in late 2016. Eloise Dupuis was 27 when she gave birth to a son. Her labor was difficult and she lost a lot of blood, so much that doctors said she would likely die without a transfusion. But Eloise was a Jehovah's Witness who believed that transfusions are biblically banned. She refused the blood, and less than a week after becoming a new mother, Eloise Dupuis died. I miss her every day, every picture. Manon Boyer was Eloise's aunt. She was beautiful. Menon is not a Jehovah's Witness, so Eloise had to keep their close relationship a secret. She was the nicest girl I ever knew in my life. She was lovely, she was loving. Boyer believes it was fear of being kicked out and shunned that led to Eloise's death. She says her niece was surrounded 24-7 by what's called the Hospital Liaison Committee, known to critics as the Blood Police a group of Jehovah's Witnesses who keep vigil around believers who are at risk of receiving a transfusion. Nobody who's not Jehovah Witness can see her. She was sequestered. Sequestered. Yeah. The doctors treating her told her many times, you will most certainly die if you don't accept blood. But she never believed it. Michelle Morin is an author who's written a book about the case, and its title is Blunt. It's called They Killed Eloise Dupuis. He argues that hospital liaison committees coerce people through fear of shunning. If you get blood, you will be disfellowshipped, so your family won't talk to you again. You will lose access to the paradise, etc., etc. And so there is so many threats, you know, and so many pressure put on these people that we're not talking about free will here. Even if a doctor, a competent doctor, tells her about the reality of blood transfusion, he has like 24, 48 hours to convince her and to change 20 years of, of, of deception, of lies. It's an impossible task. A coroner's inquest concluded Eloise was not unduly influenced by fellow Jehovah's Witnesses, a ruling her aunt thinks is absurd. She believes Eloise wanted to live, but the fear of being kicked out and shunned was too powerful. They are brainwashing everybody. You have no choice when you are a Jehovah Witness. You don't have the choice to think. She didn't deserve that. And I miss her a lot. Shaking the foundations. We're uh, out here just to talk to people and warn them. Of a rock solid belief. We will never change our scriptural position on that subject. When W5 continues. They call themselves the vast apostate army, former Jehovah's Witnesses who are speaking out against the Christian sect they say covers up allegations of sexual abuse within its ranks. 1,006 pedophiles that you guys hit! Today, they're bringing their allegations to a place they once revered. Deep in rural New York State, outside the small town of Warwick, this is Bethel, the world headquarters of the Jehovah's Witnesses. All right, let's do this. So, well, I'm on Facebook. You guys are watching live all over the world. We got people coming in from Australia and pretty much everywhere. The governing body inside knows the protesters are here. And despite the fact that it's raining, the compound's sprinklers have been turned on, full. Yeah! Parker Bryan organized the rally and has nominated himself to take their complaints to the security gate. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Can you hear me? So my name is Parker. We were hoping we could get uh, one of the governing body members to come out and say hello and have a few words. Is that possible? Okay. So you know what? Uh, the site is closed at the moment, and the persons you're requesting, they're not available. Not available. Also, you may not know this, but this is private property. Mm. So your friends aren't able to be here. The two-witness rule has got to go. The Kids are being molested, and they're not being turned into the Thank authorities. So we'll be, the we'll protesters be we'll may have not concerns. have been heard. Thank you, gentlemen. Have a great day, OK? but they would later find out they were definitely seen. They're starting to block the main entrance. This video was taken from inside the compound, well behind that security gate. Video and stills of not only the group, 
but of individual protesters as well. Someone from inside Bethel recorded the demonstrators and for some reason secretly posted it online. Yeah, down here at the gate, they're actually grouping up approaching the gate. And this isn't the only video that came from behind the gates. Greetings. We're so happy you could join us for this broadcast. The Jehovah's Witnesses' official website regularly broadcast this newscast-like presentation. Almost immediately after the protesters delivered their in-your-face message, if you'd open your Bibles to Romans chapter 12 and verse 1, this senior official appeared on the broadcast, defending the two-witness rule. The, the scripture is, ex is very, very clear. It says, no single witness may convict another for any error or any sin that he may commit. On the testimony of two witnesses or on the testimony of three witnesses, the matter should be established. There has to be a confession or two witnesses. So we will never change our scriptural position on that subject. This grassroots group of ex-witnesses didn't really expect to meet with anyone from the governing body during the protest. There's a long history of not responding to criticisms or allegations publicly, something W5 found out firsthand. This is the Canadian headquarters of the Jehovah's Witnesses in Georgetown, north of Toronto. We requested an on-camera interview here, as well as at the world headquarters in New York State. Both requests were denied. And so we sent a long list of questions surrounding their child protection policies, including whether or not police are called every time a sex abuse allegation is made. Instead of answers, we received a variation of a statement that the Jehovah's Witnesses have been using for years. They say the Jehovah's Witnesses abhor child abuse, a crime that sadly occurs in all sectors of society. We believe that loving and protective parents are the best deterrent to child abuse. The victim and his or her parents have the absolute right to report the matter to the governmental authorities. Elders do not shield abusers from the authorities or from the consequences of their actions. It's a statement that Christian Gutierrez from Calgary hopes to challenge in court. Christian is the public face of a $66 million class action lawsuit filed against the Jehovah's Witnesses organization in Canada. I want justice. I want this to stop. I would like the Watchtower to change their policy. It's just a simple policy. Mm -hmm. The lawsuit has not been certified to proceed yet, but Christian isn't waiting around. Mm -hmm. All right. Christian and his wife Katya host a YouTube channel that reaches hundreds of thousands of people. Their message, challenge the Watchtower's rules and get out. When you finally leave, feel free. Yeah, that's so true. And they're not the only ones using social media to fight back against the Jehovah's Witnesses. And uh, we're uh, out here just to talk to people and warn them. Several of the protesters who marched to the world headquarters in New York State are waging social media war against the Jehovah's Witnesses doctrine, including Trisha Franginia, who had the courage to talk about her sexual abuse online. I just want other victims to know that they're not alone and you have a voice. Um, now is the time to use it. We're all excommunicated, we've all lost family, we've all lost friends, and we're all just saying we're not invisible. We're not going to be quiet anymore. In Canada, the Jehovah's Witnesses are a legal registered charity, one of the country's richest. Each year, it raises more than $75 million tax-free. We'll be right back. <laughs> 